is a great honor to be joined by Philip Petit. He is uh, respectively the professor of human values at Princeton University and the professor of philosophy at Australian National University. And we're discussing his uh, wonderful new book, The State. Philip, welcome to the show. How are you? Thank you very much for having me. Um, so I was introduced to your work uh, last semester when I was taking a philosophy class on the competing theories of freedom, and I came up with I came across your Republican theory of freedom, where you define freedom as non-domination as opposed to non-discrimination. So, uh, why don't you explain the difference between those two? Very good. Well, the um... The notion of freedom as non-domination is one, as I see it, that was really present in the long Republican tradition that goes back to really Republican Rome and that survived in European countries, for example, in northern Italy, in the Italian states of the medieval period, um, and also that migrated to other European countries like Poland and Holland, as in the Dutch Republic of the 17th century, the English Republic of the 17th century, and of course, to the to America and the American War of Independence, and indeed the French Revolution also. Now, this notion of freedom, my view of it is that it really was superseded. It was put in the background uh, by a different notion that came on stream at just about that time. The different notion of freedom, I think of as freedom as non-interference. And I think of the Roman or Republican way of thinking, which I would like to see revived, as freedom as non-domination. So let me just give you a sense of uh, why I think of how I think of that difference. You could be free from the interference of others, for example, in certain choices, Let's focus on the choices that we all think are very important. Let's call them the basic liberties, the basic choices that, at least nowadays, we regard as almost essential for human thriving, that people should be able to make these choices, choices about, obviously, um, what to say, what to speak, what to write, who to associate with, where to move whether to keep or change job if there's an opportunity arises, whether to the freedom to compete fairly in uh, competitions with others of a certain sort, the freedom to um, um, locate in one place or another. These are basic freedoms. Now, freedom is non-interference says you're free in these choices just so long as no one is actually getting in your way. Um, that means no one is taking away that a choice in, I mean, when it comes to say, sp saying your mind, speaking your mind or staying silent. Um, freedom is non interference would say that if no one stops you from speaking your mind or keeping silent, then you're free in that choice. Freedom is non domination says no freedom doesn't come that cheaply. So let me explain that. Imagine that you felt you uh, no one was actually stopping you, getting in your way from speaking your mind. But on the other hand, someone, perhaps your boss, perhaps the head of your department in a university, perhaps a political uh, authority, they could interfere with you if they wished. And the fact that you are not interfered with is thanks to their good graces, so to speak. You owe them. They allow you to say what you will, maybe because they think what you're going to say isn't going to be damaging to them in any way or to their concerns. But now the question is, uh, do you really enjoy freedom of speech, for example? If you're being able to say what you wish or stay silent, depends on whether they allow you to stay silent or to say what you will, so that they are hovering over you. And should they turn hostile, they would be able to stop you saying what you wish. 
Uh, well, I say in the Republican tradition, the notion of freedom as non-domination basically says, no, you can't have a power hovering over you and enjoy freedom of speech in the presence of that power if it can interfere just as it wishes. So the fact that it doesn't interfere, let's suppose they are well disposed towards you, or let's suppose they think you're pretty harmless, the fact that they don't interfere doesn't make you free if they could interfere. So the idea is in order to be free in that choice, you you have to be free of a master in your life, someone who could interfere with you in that way. You have to be free of a dominus in the ancient Latin word, and hence you have to be free of what in English I call non of domination, the presence of a dominus in your life. So freedom in on this sense, it requires not just that you're not interfered with, but that no one has a power of interference should they wish to interfere in your basic liberties that we talked about, freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of movement, freedom of occupation, and so on. So that, that's the core idea. Um, say more if, if uh, I'm not sure whether that's entirely clear, but I hope it is. Yes, uh, it is. Uh, thank you. Um, so in this uh, new book of yours, The State, uh, you outline uh, what you call a neo-Republican uh, theory of uh, well, freedom and the state. So uh, why the uh, prefix neo? The neo. Well, because, you know, the Republican tradition of thinking um, as I, and that way of thinking about freedom survived really for 1,500 years, um, nearly 2,000 years, I should say. And of course, that was a period when there were lots of technologies, cultures were different, mores were different. And in order to make use of that way of thinking about freedom, you have to update it to contemporary circumstances. So for example, I've talked about the basic liberties we might enjoy. Well, in our uh, culture today, say in, in, in um, an advanced country, an advanced democratic um, country today, for example, um, in order to be free, you have to have a range of liberties, ranging from being able to live where you wish within the territory of the state at any rate, being able to say what you wish, being able to write to the newspapers, being able to campaign for a polit political party, being able to associate with others in support of a party, being able to um, uh, being able to um, uh, to to um, for example, communicate by means of internet, uh, being able to, you, and capacity to read is important as well. These basic liberties are tailored to our society. Now, if you go back to Rome and ask what are the basic liberties of a full citizen in ancient Rome, they would have been very different. Um, I probably don't need to elaborate on that. So let's leave it at that. Now, because of that, and because of other factors, you need to rethink that ideal of freedom and as to how it applies in our kind of society. So I would say, looking just at a domestic uh, society now, not looking at international relations, which are very complex, and that raises another set of issues, but just looking at a domestic society, in order to enjoy freedom as non-domination, in order not to have a dominus that's hovering over you um, in the exercise of the basic liberties we expect to enjoy, it has to be the case, for example, that the law both protects you and resources you in the exercise of these choices. For example, the law has got to protect you of course, against criminals, against others who would offend against those basic liberties. Equally, the law has to protect you against the power of an agent or an agency. It may be the corporation you work for. It may be the corporation that lives in your neighborhood where it could interfere in various ways with you in your life. It actually doesn't, but you've got to self-censor 
in order not to be interfered with. It does have the power of the dominus in your life to some extent. Now, that means that the law has got to protect you against dangers of that kind, but also it's got to resource you. For example, you couldn't enjoy basic liberties of the kind we think important if you weren't able to read, if you didn't have an address, if you weren't able indeed to use a computer to communicate. I think that's now true in our society. It wasn't true 40 years ago. Um, these are things that you've got to be resourced in doing. Of course, the state may happily stay out of your life when it comes to resourcing you if you have enough resources on your own, if you're wealthy enough to be able to establish, um, for example, uh, and to, to to have a job, to have enough income, to be able to um, move around, for example, to be able to cope with the challenges and opportunities that arise in, 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 in modern life. But if you lack those, say because you're economically unfortunate, you're going to be needed to be resourced by the state if you're going to enjoy basic liberties. So, for example, if you're absolutely destitute, you're going to depend on the goodwill of others, for example, to, to give you hand-me-downs, to give you charity, you're going to be dominated by them because you're going to depend on their goodwill for not withdrawing that and, in effect, for interfering with you. So the state in our contemporary society, if it's going to pursue the ideal of freedom as non-domination, among citizens in relation to one another and also in relation to private associations like corporations or churches, the state has got to do two things. One is protect you, and the second is resource you if needed. So that's a big, that's a way in which that old ideal of freedom as non-domination actually requires a great deal in the way of medical security, social security, educational security, informational security, all of these securities are the infrastructure that must be there for everybody in order for them to be able to exercise the basic liberties without being stood over, without being dominated by others, by individual citizens, or as I say, by groups like corporations or churches or whatever it might be. That's the first thing the state has to do, protect and resource you in your relations with other citizens within the state. But of course, if the state, for example, were run by a single dictator, that dictator might actually be very benevolent in protecting and resourcing every individual who are needed, where they didn't have the resources themselves, against others, that would be uh, that would be that would be um, very. I'm sorry, I've been interrupted. Um, that would be uh, great if people have the resources themselves. Otherwise, the state has to do that. Now, I call that civic um, freedom, the assurance of freedom in the social world in relation to other citizens and other corporations or bodies within the world. But if the state were a dictator, to go back to that thought, then you would depend on the dictator for this protection and this resourcing. But that means the, the, the dictator themselves, man or woman or group, an elite perhaps, they would have power of interfering with you because they could withdraw the protection, they could withdraw the resourcing, or they could themselves redefine the basic liberties they give you in under law, and they could be the worst of all dominances, so to speak. So in order to enjoy freedom of Islam and domination, updated to the contemporary scene, you have to have a state that protects and resources you civically or privately, if you like, but is itself not a dominus in your life? Does not itself have a power of interfering as it might wish in your life? Now, you ask, what's needed in order to, in order not to be dominated from on high, from the state? 
And obviously, what's needed is that we, the citizenry, should share in some control over the state. Because if we can dictate, for example, how the state is to protect us, how the state is to resource us, if we are to insist that the laws it establishes and imposes on us are actually laws that, as it were, are acceptable to us in general, then we have to share in a system of control over that state. What is the system of control? Well, I think it's very important that there's electoral democracy. But that's only one part of being protected against those running the state, against the government. Another part is, for example, that there are courts, you know, established by the state that will enable us even to challenge those in power if we think they're abusing their power. There have to be media under which, in, within which we can write in protest against the state. There has to be freedom of association to organize in protest against the state. And there has to be the freedom to protest even on the streets. It's really, really important that we, the people, have that power to push back against those in government if the government itself, in the name of the state, is not to actually dominate us. So you might think of these as two dimensions in which the state has got to provide us with non-domination. One is a horizontal dimension in our relations with other citizens and with private bodies by under law providing us with the protection and resourcing needed for us to be not dominated by those other citizens and bodies. But equally, and that's the vertical dimension of non-domination, the state has to be itself contained, be itself subject to control by the citizens, which is to say there has to be a constitution, there have to be laws that govern how decisions are made by the state and put constraints on how they're made and put in the gift of citizens the determination of who actually is going to be in power anyhow. That gives that system of control bottom-up control by the citizens over the state that ensures in the vertical dimension as well as the horizontal dimension that there is freedom as non-termination. So that's, I'm sorry, a rather overlong answer to your question about why do we have to update the notion of freedom as non-termination that comes to us historically. We have to do that in order to use it as a source of thinking about how best to organize our society in the sort of economically advanced culture in which we live. Yes, <laughs> that was a wonderful answer. Thank you. Um, the way I see it, um, the republicanism or republican, the republican theory of freedoms is uh, closest competitor is the liberal theory of freedom. Um, and um, I believe um, in my reading, the liberal theory values the individual, while the Republican theory values the citizen. And I think um, a good enough uh, synthesis of uh, these two ideas can be found in uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau in his uh, Du Contract Social, the Social Contract. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, he, he outlines a, a, a program wherein to be a citizen of the state, means that you have to be involved in the the functioning of the state more often than than I think uh, you would have time for basically and I think he would he would advocate for something like a um a uh, draft when it comes to um, military service amongst other things so um I guess from your reading of Rousseau what do you suppose it means to be a citizen Okay, so I'm afraid I disagree with most of what you just said because okay. I don't think the longer Republican tradition is really Rousseauian. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's, it's I don't think Rousseau is really fully faithful to the tradition. Rousseau obviously inherited ideas from the long Republican tradition, 
and including the ideal of the idea of freedom as non-domination. I mean, I've written on this elsewhere, but rather than expanding on it now, let me just assert that I think it's pretty clear in Rousseau that for him, an individual enjoys freedom just in so far as they're not, he often puts it, they're not, they don't, they're not suffering dependency on others. And as he explains by that, he means dependency on the goodwill of others. You're not free if, you can do what you wish only because there are others who allow it. You've got to be able to do what you wish within the sphere, I would say, of the basic liberties, and I think that's faithful enough to his thought. You have to be able to choose as you wish within that sphere of the basic liberties, independently of the will of others as to what you should do. And that's really freedom as non-domination. You can't have a dominance in your life. Where he differs from the longer Republican tradition is that uh, this requires me to do a little bit of background. Will you allow me to do no, that? Okay, so let me just backtrack for a moment to, to the Roman way of thinking when the Republican philosophy, as it were, was first really sketched in the work of people like Polybius and Cicero and various other writers of the period, they saw freedom certainly as requiring that you weren't subject to any master in the way in which a servant or a slave is subject to a master. They also insisted, and that's why they saw it as non-domination, they insisted that the slave of a totally gentle master, you know, or even a gullible master, someone who is away a lot of the time, that the slave could fool, they insisted that person is not free, even though he's interfered with very little because the master is so pleasant or so gentle or so gullible. But they insisted that just because he's a subject to that master, he's not free. To be free is to have the status of your subject to no one. That's crucial for them. However, they, in their own time, so, of course, that the law would protect people if you were a citizen against others exercising their power against you. That's the horizontal dimension. And they also worried about the vertical dimension. What about the state, the government, that imposed laws? Could it be a dominus in your life? And they certainly thought it could be, but they thought they had a solution to that. The solution went back to their overthrowing the kings of Rome in the uh, 6th century BC, BCE. And they threw out the kings, and over the following few hundred years, four or five hundred years, they evolved a system of government, which as they saw it, of course it was imperfect, but as they saw it, a system under which people really did have a great deal of control over those in power so that they weren't dominated from the top either. That system they evolved was described by Polybius uh, in the about 150 BCE. He was actually Greek, but lived in Rome um, and was a great fan of Rome. He thought the Romans had evolved a system that really protected against vertical domination as well. And that system he described as a mixed constitution. It wasn't a constitution that put one person in power, like a despot or a dictator. It wasn't a constitution that even had an assembly of everybody determining every matter. He associates that with a certain image of Athens, I think probably unfairly, but he associates that with everybody voting on every law. And he thought about that, that it could also dominate the individual because majoritarian voting and so on could, um, could obviously impose a will on individuals in a minority. This isn't quite true to history, but it roughly reflects the Roman Polybian way of seeing things. What he argued was, that the mixed constitution of the Romans was neither dictatorship nor that sort of um, 
mass uh, control by an assembly. It involved many different channels. That's why he called it mixed. It involved a mixture of bodies that controlled different areas and that controlled one another. He actually introduced the phrase, though of course in in um, in Greek, uh, of um, of checks and balances. So you had in Rome, you had a Senate, which was mainly people who were pretty rich, um, who determined uh, foreign policy and various aspects of how the city was run and how the Republic was run. But you also had the Senate could not make laws. In order to make a law, someone who was on the Senate, one of the officials of the period of the government, would have to propose the law, but it would then be voted on by popular assemblies, assemblies of the people, the ordinary people, not of the relatively rich and powerful like those in the Senate. And not only that, but the officials themselves who ran the place, the consuls were the top level, so to speak. There were two consuls and a number of levels in administration. They themselves were elected by gatherings of the people. And they could propose laws, but the laws couldn't be passed unless, again, and there were two assemblies of the people, distinct assemblies, unless one or other assembly agreed to those laws being established. There were also independent courts within this system. So what you can see is there are many centers of power in Rome, and there are many channels of influence. You know, if a law gets to be passed, it's got to be proposed by someone from the Senate. It's got to be agreed by an assembly of the people. And of course, it's got to find some resonance within the courts that actually apply it. And the courts themselves are very different from our courts. They were also ad hoc assemblies of people called on to judge a particular case. He called that a mixed constitution where you've got many centers of power and many channels of power. And he felt, Polybius that is, and the Romans felt that this was the answer to vertical domination. This meant that the people who ran the government, and by the way, they were replaced at each level every year, at least in theory, sometimes that was, uh, that was not the case, but in general, that was the idea. And so the Republican tradition that evolved from Rome and went down through medieval Italian cities and crossed Europe and went to America. In that tradition, on the one hand, you had the image of freedom as non -inter uh, sorry, non-domination as the ideal. But on the other hand, you had a belief in a checks and balances way of doing things that involved certain electoral procedures, as in the officials in government had to be elected, and involved the people in determining what the law was, gave the people a lot of power, but it also enabled the people to contest as they could contest those who were in power and challenge what they were doing, bring them to court and so on. The tradition basically emphasized that the ideal was freedom as non-domination. The means was a government under a mixed constitution, under a checks and balances arrangement, under what we would call a regular democratic sort of system of control, where that means more than just election, but also the possible checks and balances within the system, accountability before the courts of those in power and government, and so on. Now, Rousseau, Rousseau accepts that ideal of freedom as non-domination, as I said, but he breaks with the older tradition. I've called the older tradition the Italian Atlantic tradition of republicanism. He introduced a sort of new version of republicanism. Um, and on that version, there's just the main difference is a rejection of the mixed constitution in favor of all of the citizens gathering in a body and voting on every single law, and then establishing authorities to administer that law who would always be subject to that assembly. Now, Polybius himself would not have 
thought that that was attractive, nor would any of the early Roman theorists, because they would say, well, look, that sort of assembly can be just as domineering, just as dictatorial in a way, as a single individual. You need a system that has got these inbuilt checks and balances, including electoral democratic control. Um, why did he opt for this different way of thinking? Well, this now is a long story, historical story, and I cover it to a good extent in the state book because he inherited the view defended by a group that called themselves or were called the absolutists, beginning with Jean Baudin, who is a 16th century French theorist, and then Thomas Hobbes in the 17th century, an English theorist. And they had both been in favor of strong government. They actually wanted in general, a strong single king and they thought the big enemy was this idea of the mixed constitution, which was actually in action, in operative in, for example, the northern Italian cities, and was hailed by all the theorists, including, for example, Machiavelli defends the mixed constitution, not in The Prince, but in his other more important works. Um, and they had therefore criticized the mixed constitution massively from an absolutist point of view. They maintained that he couldn't work. They mocked it in a way by saying that it involved setting up a number of different powers that would forever be at war with one another so the society would devolve into anarchy in the course of arguing for a single king. Along the way, they acknowledged, however, that Something that might work, though neither of them wanted it, neither Baudin nor Hobbes, was an assembly that would control everything. Now, what Baudin, sorry, what Rousseau did was take the idea of freedom as non-domination, that had disappeared, frankly, in Baudin and Hobbes, by the way, would take from Baudin and Hobbes, take from the absolutists, this idea of assembly government, government by participatory assembly, because he thought that, that he accepted their criticism of the mixed constitution, rather uncritically. Um, he actually, the only passage really in which he is clear, the passage which is clearest about rejecting it is when he says, and it's really not an argument, it's, a, it's really a bit of rhetoric. He says, look, those who believe in a mixed constitution, I like people who think that and he refers to Japanese conjurers, I'm not quite sure what he had in mind there, who think that if you take the arm from one man and another arm from another man and a head from a third man and a body from, and put them all together, that it'll be still one human being. He just mocks the mixed constitution as involving the idea that there are a number of centers of power and he thinks they would not make a proper state. You need a single center of power a single sovereign, and that was the notion introduced, by the way, by Baudin and Hobbes, who was that of a sovereign who controlled everything. And that's why he went the way he went. So he said, we need freedom as non-domination, not non-domination, but we also need government by single assembly. That gave him a real problem. And he talked about, well, this assembly if it operated under conditions that meant that no majority or faction took over, then the will that it expressed in the law would be a general will, a will shared by everyone. And that really has been an extraordinarily influential image. I think it's a rhetoric that has really dominated a lot of anti-liberal thinking. We'll come back to liberalism, if you like, later over the last few hundred years, but it's a misreading of the Republican tradition. And it leads to the line that you mentioned yourself that look for the Republican being free as the collectivity being free to determine its own laws in the image of an assembly. Now I say against that, that I actually think that can lead to just as much domination as a single individual, first of all. And secondly, it's entirely infeasible. 
in contemporary society. I mean, Rousseau himself more or less admitted that, and his image really of the ideal republic was a city like Geneva, where he was born. Um, he felt that a city as small as that could be governed by a single assembly of the citizens. And of course, for him, the citizens only meant males and may even have meant males only who were, uh, had a certain degree of um, education and property. It's not quite clear. But he felt that you had a city like that would be a perfect republic ensuring freedom as non-domination by means of this assembly where factions would not emerge. My third reason for thinking that it's not a good idea is that factions will always emerge. And Rousseau himself did not give us any formula for stopping factions emerging, so to speak. So it's infeasible. It can allow dictatorship by the uh, assembly or it can allow anarchy, as in different groups, different factions getting their own way, making coalitions with one another, and so on. So I I don't think that that's true to traditional republicanism. I think it was a republicanism that was warped by the absolutist notion that you had to have a single sovereign. And I much prefer the idea, and that's what I think of as near a republican idea, of having a the older ideal shared with Rousseau freedom as non-domination, but the means of ensuring freedom as non-domination at the horizontal level of having a law that protects and resources people, and then the vertical dimension, having a system of control, a bit like an updated version of the mixed constitution, with elections for sure, with independent courts, with different bodies within the government that check and balance one another with authorities that are independent of those elected, like the courts, for example, but also like an electoral commission that will determine whether the elections are being conducted fairly and so on. That's what I think of as the older tradition, and it's the one that I sort of stand by, and it's the one I'd like to see renovated fully in this neo-republican way of thinking, which happily seems to be shared now by quite a large number of people. Yes, um, I think including myself to an extent. Um, so with that, uh, let me just revert to my initial question, which is um, under the Republican theory- About liberalism. Yes, yeah. So I was just differentiating between uh, liberalism and republicanism, but- um, Right. Uh, but right. under this, under the theory of republicanism or neo-republicanism, uh, what does it mean to be a citizen? Well, under the theory of neo-republicanism, what it means to be a citizen is that you're somebody who is protected and resourced by the law in the country where you belong, where you are a citizen. I think that in any country, um, all adult, um, I mean, able-minded, and that can be very low uh, bar, more or less permanent residents should be citizens. But what it means to be a citizen is you're embodied within the law and protected and resourced by the law if resourcing is necessary so that you can, as it were, walk tall. That was always a Republican image. Look others in the eye without reason for fear or deference. And it's also to be a citizen who's part of the citizen body that shares in this system of control over those who lay down the laws so that the laws are made on the citizens' terms, on terms that the citizens, as it were, stand over. That's what I think of what it is to be a citizen. Okay, now the issue of the relationship between neo-republicanism and liberalism. Well, it contrasts most sharply with what you have called neoliberalism, what is normally called neoliberalism, which is a particularly right-wing version of, of liberalism, but it answers to the original classical liberalism, which, by the way, emerged only about 200 years ago and really tended to replace uh, the republicanism of that period. 
we can talk about that history a little bit if you like, but putting aside history for the moment, the neo-Republican believes, first of all, in freedom as non-interference rather than freedom as non-domination. And that means, well, let me simplify, that means at least two things. One is means it means that um, you're going to be anti, anti-government and pro market let me put it that way and here's why um with the government you're going to say look isn't the law that is imposed coercively by government doesn't it always interfere with the lives of citizens answer yes doesn't that mean that we should reduce the state as far as possible? We should have a night watchman state, as it used to be called, or a minimal state. Reduce interference by the law as much as possible. Remember on the Republican notion, if the state didn't dominate you, it was controlled by the people, then the interference that it practices under that control it might be a dangerous weapon. It might be something we want to, you know, keep tabs over. But it's not going to be inimical interference because it's going to be interference that's controlled by the very people it interferes with. So it's not going to be a case of domination, right? It's going to be non-dominating interference, and that's not a problem under freedom as non-domination. All interference is a problem for the neoliberal. And so we should reduce the state. That's one strand in neoliberalism. The other strand is now look at corporations and look at the marketplace and look what happens there. When people are employed by firms, at least ideally, they're employed because that's what, um, that's what they contract to do. They sign up the terms of employment with their employer or when they buy or sell, they enter contracts with one another. And they said, but if I agree to, for example, as an employer, signing up to it with an employer, if I agree that I will do as the employer wishes in a certain area and respond in return for a certain salary, then I'm not interfered with by anything that the employer does because I, in my contract, have agreed to it. So the neoliberal idea is you minimize the state and you maximize the market, you know? Okay, now, I said about the Republican, the Republican would not minimize the state because it's domination by the state you want to counter, not necessarily non-dominating interference. You want to make sure that the state is not going to uh, be a dominant in your life, but you have to have the state on the Republican view because it's needed to protect and resource people. Now, on the on the other aspect of neoliberalism under which we let the market rip, so to speak, allow you know it to go its own way with minimal legislative control, from the Republic point of view, that can be disastrous because we know that under pressure of unemployment, for example, employees might agree contractually to enter a relationship in which they're going to be subject to the will of the boss in all sorts of ways. For example, the boss may be allowed under the contract to change where, what sort of area of the factory or whatever it might be, the worker works every day to change the hours that the work, to change the conditions under which the worker operates um, and to push around or abuse the worker in various ways, sure that they're not going to give up the job for fear of unemployment. But that's domination that's allowed within the workplace. What the Republican, remember I spoke about the theory of, of uh, vertical non-domination, uh, sorry, horizontal non-domination or social justice in the Republican case, it would say that workers ought to be resourced against that sort of domination. Contracts of employment should be regulated so they don't allow for the possibility that people end up, as it were, contracting themselves into a dominated relationship. And there are all sorts of ways in which this can happen. 
Incidentally, um, that's an example of how neo-republicanism can have policy implications. There are quite a number of people in labor law uh, these days. In fact, there's a book going to appear later in the year, a collection by philosophers and, uh, and uh, lawyers. I've got a piece myself in it, looking at what protections are needed in the workplace to guard against domination within the workplace. So you can see now the, the contrast. Neo Republican wants a state that is rich enough to uh, protect and resource its citizens without being so strong as to dominate them. So it's got to be controlled by them. And resourcing and protecting the citizens can include resourcing them and protect them within the workplace, for example, so that the market is subject to the regulation of a state that is itself controlled by the citizenry. On the neoliberal view, by contrast, first of all, you get a minimal state that's just required to guard against the well, dangers of invasion by another country and against the minimal dangers of, you know, that would come about if people are starving and so on. It's got to have a low bar that it ensures, but it's a, going to be a weak state and it's going to let the market rip, you know, giving freedom so-called, that's to say, non-interference, um, its head in allowing people enter whatever contracts they wish. The poor will become poorer and weaker, the rich stronger and more dominating. So they're they're pretty, pretty deeply opposed. But I I can't uh, I can't stop this line of thought without adding that of course liberalism does not always mean neoliberalism. As I said, that's an extreme right-wing version of liberalism. My feeling about liberalism more generally, for example, in America, liberalism means left-wing liberalism. And it's pol the policies that left-wing liberals support will correspond in great part with the policies that neo-Republicans will support. They differ in various ways, but, you know, broadly they're they're both on the left. I would just say the narrow Republican has a, a neater way, so to speak, of summarizing the main message and the guiding ideal. Um, but liberals on the left, they tend to adopt policies of the same kind. What I find, they have a problem, though, in explaining why these are the right policies. For the narrow Republican, they're the right policies, both the vertical and the horizontal Policy, policies, they're the right ones because that's the way of maximizing the enjoyment of freedom as non-domination in the exercise of basic liberties. It's the way of enabling people to be able to walk tall, knowing they are protected and resourced by a state that they share in controlling, to be able to walk tall, to be able to look others in the eye without reason for fear of deference. That's a, the guiding ideal behind the approach. And now you ask, well, what's the ideal behind left-wing liberalism? And here you find there are sort of a whole variety of values that are induced, not a single value like freedom is not domination, but a whole mix of values range from equality, freedom of uh, equality of opportunity, equality of resourcing, um, Democracy is thrown into the mix, but they also, it's like a shopping list, you know, of ideals, rather than a set of ideals that derive from one driving source. So while policy-wise, left liberalism, the American sense of liberalism, really does coincide often, not always, but often with neo-republicanism, it's a shopping list sort of political philosophy versus a political philosophy that's centered around one source. Okay. Um, since you mentioned neoliberalism, um, perhaps the most well-known articulator of that strand of ideas is uh, Milton Friedman. Um, and, yes, one of them, uh, yeah. Of course, um, Hayek also comes to mind. Um, the, the issue that I see with um, the... Uh, the pro-free market or laissez-faire um, thinkers is that they would like to have um, they would like to have less regulations on businesses and commerce, but at the same time, in order for the market to be free, 
and fair, so to speak, um, a state has to be strong enough to enforce uh, certain laws that regulate, um, say, fair contracting laws and um, and I guess uh, worker management bargain laws or whatever. So, so in that sense, they are stuck in that dilemma. But um, the initial um, conflict in which they wish to answer is that, well, if the state is uh, too interventionist towards the market, then then the result is that you have a well a more ineffective market as well as uh, arguably a more ineffective state. So um, I guess um, I, I think you've already answered this question, but how would you elaborate on the proper relationship between the state and the market? Well, the, this really takes us to the themes covered in that recent book you mentioned ni nicely, the, the state. Um, because uh, what I look at in that book is um, the state as an institution. Before ever it becomes just or before it becomes a republic, it's meant to be a book that will have a companion volume, which I'm going to call From the State to the Republic. Mm -hmm. So it's the state just considered as such. And um, one of the problems I consider in great part in that book are, are there restrictions on what the state can productively do? And among the restrictions alleged uh, on the state as to what I can productively do, I consider the restriction associated with laissez-faire theory that says, look, the state cannot productively interfere in the market that the market is a self-regulating system that should operate with minimal state, so to speak, interference in that system. And what I argue in the, uh, in the state book about on that particular restriction, that, um, that if you just look at the history of markets, uh, say there are three aspects to markets. Uh, one is you have to have an understanding of what property is. But that doesn't just mean property in the sense of the house you live in or the land that you work, which it might have meant two or 300 years ago. But nowadays it also means the shares you own, if you own shares. It means the, uh, the books that you buy on internet, you know, that you can't actually sell to others, or you can't even gift to others, you know. Property means something very different there. Um, property has come to mean something intangible. Okay, now, what makes it the case that chairs are property? What makes it the case that the book you buy on Kindle or whatever is property? What makes it the case that, um, um, that um, you know, the bonds you own are property? Well, what makes it the case is that the law says they are property and the law allows them to be exchanged in various ways. So the state was there a necessary, essential, in order to define property. Or, for example, if you own a dog, the state allows you own a dog, but under most uh, systems of law nowadays, that doesn't allow you to treat the dog in any old way. You know, there are laws against for supporting the humane treatment of pet animals. Or suppose you want a house. It might have been the case 300 years ago that you could do anything you wished with the house you owned. But nowadays, you can't, you can't put another floor on without getting permission of the... And that property system, even at the level of the houses, you know, couldn't operate without the state laying down regulations. And if it doesn't lay down regulations, Things go crazy. We know parts of the world where, you know, skyscrapers go up beside ordinary dwellings, making the ordinary dwellings uninhabitable almost. So that's property. But then there's money. You know, what counts as money? Well, again, the state is absolutely essential in defining what money is and has been traditionally. And in the book, in that particular chapter, I trace the history of property and money. And then the third element is who are the players in the market? Corporations. But the notion of a corporation is established in law. You know, what the rights are, what the duties are, 
What are the conditions under which a corporation forms? How may it act? And so on. Corporations exist by virtue of law. So it's absurd to say, you know, these essential elements of the market, including what you mentioned yourself, John, which is the relations that are allowed, the contracts that are allowed, what are allowed, sold and bought and not sold and bought. Uh, that's all has to be established by law. So it's absurd to say that the economy or the market is a self-regulating mechanism independent of the state, given it only exists by virtue of the state. Now, what I think may be true as a policy matter is that while, of course, the state has to continually update the market sort of an economy regulations and rules, for example, to deal with uh, social media, we still haven't done that, but we're going to have to do that. Um, and the market associated with uh, the internet and so on. Um, while the state has to do that and should do that, so there should be state regulation of the economy, probably what's a bad idea is governments chopping and changing with the economy. You know, as for example, one party or another gets into power suddenly everything changes. That's a bad idea. I think the economy probably couldn't survive that sort of uh, ad hoc intervention in the market by government. Um, but that's, and if there's any, perhaps I agree on that with some of the laissez-faire theorists, but I reject holus bolus most of their view about hands off the market. Absolutely not. You know, conditions of employment, all of these have to be regulated by the law. There's no inherent restriction on the state. And I say then as an air Republican, and the state should interfere to make sure that people are fully protected and resourced within market life in order to be able to walk tall, look others in the eye without reason or fear of deference, consistently with the market still flourishing. <laughs> Okay, so on this final note, um, I'd like to ask you about the um, relationship under the Republican theory uh, regarding the state and the nation. I understand that in wow. today's times, we live under this hyphenated uh, system of nation state. But um, since I'm talking to you in Australia, um, um, the there's always a conflict between um, the Australian state, as well as uh, the various nations that form the Australian Aborigines uh, population. And I think that stems from the fact that Australia, the, the Australian nation state government was uh, formed by, well, um, the, the settler population from Britain and elsewhere. And because of that, there's always a fear and risk of uh, domination of this uh uh, you know, the descendants of settlers, that population, and the uh, nations of uh, its native inhabitants. So, how do you suppose? Absolutely. Yeah. How do you well, suppose I, under the non domination framework uh, that can be prevented? Let me say there is there are two issues here that I think are better kept separate. One is the issue of, um, a multinational state, a multi-ethnic state, multicultural state, let's call it, where we're talking about, as we're settlers coming from different places to the same area as in Australia or Canada or America for that reason. Uh, for, uh, for the, uh, okay, that's one issue. And the other issue is the relationship between the state Settler states, as you might call them, like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, America, like the relationship between the settler state and indigenous people. Now, on the first, I'm very optimistic. I think it's pretty clear that the multi multicultural state can actually work very, very well. I think in Australia, it works extraordinarily well. I think in Canada, it works extraordinarily well. Um, I think it works less well in America, probably because uh, people from different uh, cultures tend to live together and form sort of silos rather than being dispersed, which is the general pattern in, say, Australia, New Zealand and Canada, 
which I know reasonably well. Uh, and in Australia, I know best of all, after all, I spent half my life here. Um, and I could extend to Ireland, where I spent much of my life and still have a strong affiliation. I'm also a citizen of Ireland. Uh, that's become more and more multicultural with all of the immigrants coming in. These societies can operate very, very well. Um, is there a single nation? Well, I don't like myself the notion of the nation because it does suggest a sort of unicultural that we have to find this, you know. Now, I think we have to come together on certain values, the values associated, I would say, with freedom as non-domination. And if people don't agree on those, you know, that does make for a problem. But consistently with having very different religious traditions, very different cultures in all sorts of other ways, people from different backgrounds can form very, very peaceful, prosperous societies and societies where fairness, you know, can actually operate and where people can look one another in the eye, regardless of their cultural identity, without reason for fear or deference. Of course, there are problems in every society, but I would say in general, uh, Australia does pretty well. I think Canada does uh, does pretty well, New Zealand does well in all of these respects. Okay, now the other problem though that you bring up is the problem with indigenous uh, populations in these countries. And that's much trickier, much more challenging actually. And I think I'm not, I'm certainly not happy about the existing state of affairs in a way which I am relatively happy about how things are going on the uh, multicultural front with as between settlers. But the issue of how settlers relate to indigenous uh, culture, that is, that is very different. Myself, I strongly favor an arrangement, a constitutional arrangement under which indigenous people are given certain special status or protections that might be, it varies from place to place, or it might be allowing a degree of, of self-government, for example, in indigenous communities where there are indigenous communities that are associated with particular territories. I think it can involve, you know, special electoral arrangements whereby um, they have their own representatives in parliament, apart from the representatives of the constituencies where they may also belong. That happens, for example, in New Zealand. I wish very much that an arrangement which had been proposed by the government here in Australia and was voted on a referendum um, last October had got up under which there would be a group uh, of representative indigenous peoples and assembly that would basically offer advice, but publicly to government on issues related to indigenous policy. And um, that unfortunately was opposed by right-wing views in general. I honestly don't understand why. Um, there, were a, there was a total mix of complaints raised that didn't seem to me to amount to a coherent case against it, but they were very effective electorally. Referendums are very hard to pass in Australia. I don't think a referendum, I'm subject to correction on this, may never have passed unless it was bipartisan. And because the opposition, um, a right-wing opposition, it's more left-wing, center-left uh, government, um, were opposed on this because the opposition decided to oppose it, it wasn't surprising that it failed to get up. But I think we need very special um, ways of accommodating uh, indigenous aspirations and indeed complaints, because after all, our settler populations have taken over a country that was essentially theirs in, uh, in previous times. Now, I've talked... There are two dimensions, as I said, to domestic policy, always the horizontal and the vertical, always the one to do with social justice horizontally and democratic justice vertically, so to speak. I think that uh, what I've been talking about with indigenous peoples is 
introducing some element of democratic justice for them, given their special situation. Um, but the other element is social justice for indigenous peoples. Now, unfortunately, as that happens, uh, you know, quite a lot of money has been put into um, looking after the social justice concerns of indigenous populations in the countries I mentioned. I think in all of them, Canada and Australia, I think you'll find if you look at the average expenditure on an indigenous person, it's probably relatively high, actually. But it hasn't been very effective. In all of these societies, there are still real problems for indigenous people. And that is that is terrible. Now, I have no easy solution to that. Um, but I just would like to keep it on the agenda as a problem we've got to keep thinking about and hope that, you know, as time goes on, we'll come up with more pro progressive and successful policies. I think that you're interrelated, that if we did have more democratic justice for Indigenous peoples with more representation, special recognition and so on, that that might actually interact with the social policy and uh, in bring improvement on that front. But of course, I can't be certain of that. And um, and so I think we just have to hope that we can do better in the future. I think uh, we can end on that note. Thank you very much, Professor Philip Petit, for joining the show. That's very nice. Thank you for having me.